All right, so today we're going to continue on with our cardiac lecture series here. And today we're going to be talking about cardiac output. Okay. So I should have handed back your worksheets already here. And other thing I'd like to start with today is before we kick off uh, cardiac output here, uh, last time we talked about the different EKG readouts, the electrocardiograms that you can see with um, your heart here. So when I, we were just unpacking here, my wife and I, and I found her old arrhythmia recognition guide here that she would carry around with her back when she worked on the gen med surge floor um, as a nurse. So she'd pull this out and look at EKG feedback and they'd kind of know what was going on with them then. So it gives your standard uh, PQRST waves and then shows all the different arrhythmias that it can occur. Uh, some of them we talked about. I'm going to pass this around in class. Uh, the ones with the green stars are the ones you should recognize. So we have atrial fibrillation here. And that's where the atria is not contracting as it should or completely. So we're missing that P wave um, associated with that is absent. But everything else kind of looks normal. There is ventricular fibrillation. So remember we talked about that. Um, that type of fibrillation is... Uh, very serious and we need to correct that and that's with the defibrillators that you'll see hanging in the hallways of public places. Uh, with that you see generally the P wave is absent uh, and then your QRS is absent as well and you just kind of have this because nothing is contracting as it should. And then we have heart block as well. So remember heart block you'll have the atria going at one speed maybe that's uh, 70 beats per minute and then with heart block there, you're going to have the ventricle going at a much slower speed, maybe around 30. Uh, so that is also a very serious condition. Um, and then pacemakers can generally correct for that, however. You're generally comatose if you have heart block. So. Okay, so I'll pass this around here in class and you can get familiar with that. Okay, so our fish fact for today. Uh, this is also cardiac related. So fish, they possess the simplest type of a true heart, and that's a two-chambered organ, and it's composed of one atrium and a single ventricle. So their low oxygen blood is going to enter the atrium, and that's where the pacemaker cells are found that we talked about. And then it's going to flow into the ventricle. You're going to get a strong contraction from that ventricle. You can see how muscular it is. And then that's going to move into a special chamber called the bulbous arteriosus. And the sole purpose of that is to dampen the contraction or fluid coming out of the ventricle because straight from the ventricle, it's going to the gills and the gills are very fragile. So that blood movement has to be dampened by the bulbous arteriosus. Now fish have a single circulation here. So coming out of the heart, it's going to move up to the gills, drop off CO2, pick up oxygen, and then move to the systemic portions of the fish and then back to the heart. So single type loop. Versus the double circulation from the four chambered hearts that happens within humans that we talked about a couple lectures ago. So we're going to move into the right atrium, move to the right ventricle, pumped out through pulmonary circulation in the lungs, and then back into left atrium, left ventricle, and then pet, uh, pumped out systemically. So that's the fish heart as it compares to the human heart. All right, so our, elected, our objectives for today here or we need to understand cardiac output, and that's going to be as a product of heart rate and stroke volume. So with heart rate, we're going to look at how there's control by the autonomic nervous system. And we'll compare that to stroke volume, where we look at both intrinsic and extrinsic control. And we'll explain what that means shortly. And then we'll have a little case study to finish up class today. All right, so you can go ahead and pause here and... Uh, Print off worksheet 22 and complete that as we go, or hopefully you're filling this out in class. Okay, a couple of heart-related science comics today as well. I have a cardiac surgeon saying, hey, I found a heart. So they deem that exploratory surgery. Another comic up here, sorry, it's a little smaller read. Uh, it says, all right, so we dropped the heart. The floor is clean. So I think that's the best application of the five second rule that I've heard of here. Okay, so cardiac output, first we'll define it here. That is the volume of blood the heart pumps in one minute. That's cardiac output, typically we'll see CO. 
Okay? And that's a product of heart rate, which is beats per minute, or we generally see BPM, and stroke volume, which is the blood pumped from each ventricle per beat. That's stroke volume. So using that, go ahead and think about this with your neighbor here. Determine the cardiac output using the information for the resting heart below. So the average resting heart rate is about 70 beats per minute, and the average stroke volume is around 70 mils per beat. All right, so think about what cardiac output is and see if you can come up what cardiac output would be given these two pieces of information. Take a minute here and pause. All right. Hopefully you were able to come up with this, that cardiac output, again, is the product of heart rate by stroke volume. So we'll have 70 beats per minute, the heart rate, by our stroke volume, 70 mils per beat, and we get 4,900 mils per minute for our cardiac output. Uh, it's about a there are 1,000 mils per liter, so this is around uh, 5 liters per minute. So if you think about that our total blood volume is around five liters, each half of the heart, because remember this cardiac output is for a, one ventricle, uh, is pumping the entire blood volume in one minute. Okay? And that's just resting heart rates when we're sitting on the couch. In fact, when we're exercising, we can move 20 to 25 liters per minute. So that's more than a five gallon water cooler to see that you, the uh, large water coolers there in the office. It's more than that. Those are, those are 19 liters. This is 20 to 25 liters per minute. So how can cardiac output, which is heart rate times stroke volume, vary so much depending on activity? Well, the answer is the autonomic nervous system. So go ahead here. We're going to fill in your worksheet again here. So the autonomic nervous system is innervated by both the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. And this modifies rate, so heart rate, and contraction force. So parasympathetic here, it does that via the vagus nerve. Okay, and The vagus nerve supplies the atrium and not the ventricles. So it affects the SA and the AV nodes. We can compare that then to the sympathetic nervous system here, innervation, which is via the cardiac nerve, and that goes to both the atria and the ventricles. So sympathetic has effect on both the atria and the ventricles, and also affects the SA and AV nodes. Okay. Now, it works most effectively here um, by working on the SA nodes. So remember, that's the first node here, we see those um, autorhythmic cells there, then the sinoatrial area here of the heart, the SA node. So that's the pacemaker of the heart. So the autonomic nervous system works primarily on that SA node. Okay, so think about this. Parasympathetic stimulation of the heart will, will it increase cardiac output or decrease cardiac output? All right, so this is review. This is an older slide you've seen way back from lecture eight. Parasympathetic is associated with rest and digest. So sympathetic systems promote responses for quiet, relaxed situations. That should be parasympathetic situations. And it promotes body maintenance and activities such as digestion. So here we're comparing sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic. So with parasympathetic here, rest and digest, you get constriction of pupils, um, you get saliva flow for digestion, and you get a slowing heartbeat. Okay? So this is the part of the nervous system that makes us calm. So let's look at the effects of parasympathetic nervous system here. So what we see is decreasing firing of the SA node. So remember that's the node that's within the sinus or the sinus of the atrium right there. And what this does is it's a product of a 
prolonged drift to threshold. So if you remember this action potential figure here with the cardiac or those autorhythmic cells here, we see a slow depolarization or that pacemaker potential. And that's due to those funny channels that open um, with hyperpolarization, the sodium channels open. So you get this slow drift. Then we decrease, we increase this drift to threshold here with the parasympathetic stimulation. We also then see a increase at the AV node, that next node um, in that fibrous pathway there. So if we increase the delay at that EV node, um, that's so the atria and the ventricles don't contract at the same time. Okay, that's what that delay is for there, and we're increasing that delay to slow the heart down. And there's little effect on the ventricular contraction here, because again, it's not innervated by the parasympathetic stimulation. So what we see then here is something like this. These are the action potentials, membrane potential. The black dashed line here shows the typical SA node pacemaker activity. So then the red line here shows pacemaker activity with the parasympathetic stimulation. So we see here that there's a slower drift now to threshold. So with that slower drift, we get action potentials less often. Okay. So let's compare this to sympathetic stimulation now. And here we see increased SA node firing, and that's due to shortening the drift to threshold. So here we're shortening this drift so we get action potentials more often. We also see a delay now, a reduced delay at this AV node. So that delay between the atrial and ventricular contractions are shortening. And we also see there's enhanced atrial and ventricular contraction because both are innervated by the sympathetic stimulation, those cardiac sympathetic nerves. So what we see then, something like this. So again, the black dashed line is the uh, regular uh, action potential, inherent action potential within the heart. And then our blue then is with sympathetic stimulation. So we can see here that we've shortened this drift through those funny channels to threshold here. So we get action potentials more frequently than we would without sympathetic stimulation. Okay, so that's, that's control of heart cardiac. So let's talk about control of heart rate now. So recall that the first determinant of cardiac output is heart rate. How is heart rate control? Well, under resting conditions, parasympathetic dominates. So this is due to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So again, that's from a few lectures ago. And this is the rest and digest neurotransmitter here with the parasympathetic. This suppresses sympathetic activity, uh, like which is the neurotransmitter norepinephrine, or NE, which is the fight or flight response. So for example, if you were to block autonomic innervation to the heart, so no sympathetic, no parasympathetic, the resting heart rate would actually increase to around 100 beats per minute, not 70. That 70 comes from the parasympathetic control over resting conditions. So resting parasympathetic is active and it holds the heart around 70 beats per minute. Okay, so if you wanna to turn to your worksheet here, we'll continue filling that out. So we see here that heart rate can be increased with sympathetic activity. And if we increase parasympathetic activity, that'll decrease our heart rate. So heart rate can be altered in either direction by shifting this balance of autonomic nervous system. We can speed up by increasing sympathetic and uh, while decreasing parasympathetic and then vice versa. So notice here that epinephrine can also increase heart rate. That's not an autonomic response, uh, but it acts in the same manner as the sympathetic response. So we're going to include that in our figures for the most part from now on. Okay, so think about this. You're about to take an exam and your heart rate is rapid. This is likely due to blank release. What neurotransmitter release are we going to see here that is making our heart rate 
increase in rate. Okay. That should be B and C then, norepinephrine and epinephrine. So you see norepinephrine is the sympathetic neurotransmitter and epinephrine acts in the same manner. So that's gonna be D, B and C. So that's control of heart rate. What about control of stroke volume? That's the second determinant of cardiac output. Okay. Well, control of stroke volume, and remember that's the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle during each beat, is under intrinsic control and extrinsic control. So intrinsic control are things that are built in. It's like the heart's inherent ability to vary stroke volume here. So this is related to the extent of venous return, how much blood is returning to the heart. Now there's also extrinsic control. So this means extrinsic coming from the outside. And that's because the heart here is under control of the sympathetic nervous system. So it's the extent of that sympathetic simulation for extrinsic control. So let's first take a look at intrinsic control here and the venous return. So intrinsic control depends on the lake tension relationship of cardiac muscle. So if you think back to our lecture on skeletal muscle here, this figure's review, this is skeletal muscle, not cardiac muscle. Remember that for skeletal muscle, there is an optimal uh, length. So, and in fact, with skeletal muscle, it's the resting muscle length here that is optimal, or A here on this figure. And it generates the maximum tension during contraction. We get maximum overlap of the myosin and actin. With stretching, you get reduced overlap. And then with compression or shortened muscle, you get reduced overlap of actin and myosin. Well, so you get a decrease in tension and a decreased muscle contraction. So let's compare that then to cardiac muscle. So this figure is a little bit different. This is our length tension curve here, but we're here on our X axis. We have end diastolic volume and stroke volume. End diastolic volume is the same thing as venous return. So remember diastol is the heart relaxation uh, and filling with blood. So with end diastol or end filling, it's how much volume is in that ventricle at the end of relaxation, at the end of filling. So just like venous return here. Okay, so let's start digging into this figure here. So here we have normal resting length of the heart. And it's important to notice that normal resting length is below the optimal length of the heart. Okay, so resting cardiac fiber less than optimal length. Okay. So then we have some type of um, end diastolic volume associated with that, which gives us a related stroke volume. Now, as we increase our venous return or an increase in that end diastolic volume here, again, they're synonymous. What we do is we're stretching the heart out. So you're increasing, increasing venous return or diastolic volume, which means it's filling more, right? So as that heart fills more with blood, becomes more distended, and you're stretching the heart, which means we're stretching out these actin myosins so that you effectively get more actin, actin myosin overlap. So we're moving from kind of a contracted state to more stretched out where you get more actin and myosin uh, cross bridge formations forming. So we get a stronger contraction, which leads to an increase in stroke volume. Okay. That makes sense? Okay, and then this increase in stroke volume associated with uh, stretching the heart, we call Starling's Law. So increased stretching equals increased stroke volume, and that's due to that increase in contraction strength. That is Starling's Law. Then this last portion of the figure here, we have this dash portion. Uh, that's what happens with overstretching, but unlike with skeletal muscle here, when we're stretch path optimum, we don't get contractions anymore. So we don't really need to pay too much attention to that. Okay, so let's look at this another way here. So we see that with increased venous return, we have intrinsic control or that inherent control over end diastolic volume, EDV. We have more blood coming back to the heart. There's more filling the ventricle then uh, during relaxation as we stretch. 
we get an increase in cardiac contraction. We're stretching, we're getting better overlap of actin and myosin, which gives us an increase in contraction strength, which increases our stroke volume. Increased contraction, we're able to eject more blood out of the heart or increase that stroke volume. Now, there's also extrinsic control or factors outside of the heart that affect stroke volume as well. And these are products of the sympathetic active um, nervous system as well, again, as epinephrine here. So these are factors outside of the heart. So let's take a look at these here. Extrinsic control. That's control of stroke volume by cardiac sympathetic nerves and epinephrine. So we see here that sympathetic activity has an extrinsic control over stroke volume. And it does that by acting uh, on calcium at the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So with sympathetic activation, we'll get an increase in calcium release at that sarcoplasmic reticulum. With that uh, calcium there, it's going to bind to that, think back to the skeletal muscle, it's going to bind to that troponin. It's the same within cardiac muscle. It's going to pull that tropomyosin rope out of the way, exposing those uh, binding sites. And we're going to get more cross bridge formation with our myosin and actin. With more cross bridge cycling, um, we see an increase in contraction. And again, with an increase in contraction, we can inject more blood and increase our stroke volume. Okay. Now there's also extrinsic control over venous return. And it does this by decreasing vein diameter. So smaller veins squeeze more blood to the heart, essentially. So we increase venous return. There's more blood there filling our ventricle during relaxation. We get greater contract and strength there than with that cardiac muscle stretching and it increases stroke volume. All right. So here we have a mini case study. We have Patricia. She's a 78 year old female and she's been experiencing edema, which is swelling in her ankles and her feet. She has a rapid heartbeat and is often out of breath. Additionally, she has no appetite and must urinate multiple times throughout the night. Okay, so take a few minutes and try to diagnose Patricia here. You can use your phones, your computers, uh, search key terms and words here. Let's see what we can come up with. All right, so should have maybe come up with that Patricia is suffering from heart failure. This is where cardiac output does not meet demands of the body. So this is often due to ventricle, a ventricle or ventricles weakening and failing. And then your veins become, become congested with blood. The ventricles are failing. They're not pumping out what they should. You get a backup of blood in the system. And that's called blood congestion. This is also known as CHF or congestive heart failure. Now the reasons for heart failure are due to some type of damage to the heart. So again, this can be um, due to a heart attack and then you get actual cardiac cell death. Or perhaps it's due to prolonged pumping against elevated blood pressure, which hurts the heart over time. Okay, so let's consider this last one here. Prolonged pumping against elevated blood pressure. This could be due to plaques, or that's fat essentially, or cholesterol that builds up within your arteries. So those could be arteries uh, within your heart or other arteries within your body. So here we're looking at a coronary artery. We have these fast fat deposits here, plaques, that are restricting blood flow. So over time, that restricted blood flow may lead to congestive heart failure. Uh, one of the treatments for this uh, is an angioplasty. So it could be a coronary angioplasty, for example, which is going in through the heart. Here we use a catheter, and I'll pass this around in class. This is pretty neat. It's a little syringe here. So they'll push that in, inflate the syringe, and try to move some of that plaque. So let's watch this short video here on the coronary angioplasty. Percutaneous coronary intervention, also known as coronary angioplasty, opens narrowed coronary arteries. In this procedure, doctors insert a long, thin tube called a catheter in an artery in the groin or wrist 
and thread it to the affected artery using x-ray imaging. Doctors then inject a small amount of dye through the catheter to the artery to help them see any blockages or narrowing on x-ray images. A catheter with a balloon on the tip is then inserted through the first catheter and guided to the heart. When the catheter reaches the narrowed or blocked area of the artery in the heart, doctors inflate the balloon to reopen the artery and improve blood flow. The balloon is then deflated and removed. In most cases, doctors then insert another catheter with a mesh tube attached, called a stent. The stent is then placed in the narrowed area of the artery to prevent re-narrowing after the artery is widened. Doctors then remove the catheter. All right. So that is all I have for today. Complete your worksheet. Turn it in in class, and we will see you in a couple days. Have a great weekend.